Caddis Maxos here. This time with the teardown of the Bosch 1634 VS Recipient Scanning Saw. 10.5 amps. Actually made in the USA, I was surprised. Bosch Recipient Saws are not the, my favorite, and they're generally ones I wouldn't recommend. I know I really like Milwaukee Sawzalls, but you know, other brands are good. The Bosch ones, it seems, and their newer RS series is like the, the gears and stuff seem to be okay. They're always just a bit bulky, kind of like the DeWalt's and stuff. But always issues with the blade retention and so many Bosch Sawzalls. This particular unit I got super cheap. The old blade clamp, it was dropped or something, is just totally busted out. And they continued to use it without that for a while until there were issues with the actual blade retention. The issue with the blade retention is they have this quick release and it's kind of like a can that you know is a half moon so you push it in until you have enough clearance to slip the blade over and then it sits if i can get there just sits right there on the little peg that's inside this they have like a little shim that is over the top so they don't have a groove in this can where it kind of glides over the retention pin instead they have like the shim plate which like in this one is missing, so when you put in the blade, it just wobbles all over the place. On the newer RS saws, they have a twist style that's like a knockoff of the Milwaukee, or copy of the Milwaukee, and it always has issues, and I just don't know what it is about uh, Bosch's. Some people have good luck with them, but I for, unfortunately have not seen a lot of that. What's also interesting, at least on this classic style, is they're just using like a power, any other rotary hammer or power drill variable trigger, but the reverse switch, uh, still offers a center position to lock the trigger, which I did kind of like. And then they just use it for uh, a low and a high. So I thought we'd just tear it down and see how this old orbiting saw works. I don't believe it's counterbalanced. It seems oh, pretty low vibration. Uh, the gearbox is just, it seems to use a swash plate or a ball bearing wobble plate that goes back and forth. Uh, which usually are pretty compact, but for some reason Bosch made the gear case just too, way too wide. That's really one of the things that sets apart Milwaukee Sawzalls is that the gear case is pretty flat, so you can get a good grip on it, whether you're holding it from down there or from up here. Let's go ahead and uh, pop those brushes out first. They did make it pretty easy to access the brushes on this just by popping out these two screws and then release and then popping up these covers. Just like so. Let me get a screwdriver in there. And then you just pry up the cover and it just pops right out of there. We'll take out the other one. Pretty large brush holders. I find this interesting is what they've done is they've corrugated the brush guide so that those high points act as rails so there's less friction on the brush. And uh, that's actually a pretty neat idea, and I do like that it's super easy to change them. The brush covers actually had an extra piece of plastic in there. I think that was pretty neat. As far as taking these brushes out, it's actually pretty easy because they have a connector there. You just take this and grab that and unplug it. It's going to be pretty stiff. There it is. And then you can just pop this little wire loose. You take the clock spring, usually you just take the clock spring and you'll lift it up to the side, get enough clearance, and then sometimes they'll, you'll be able to twist them enough where they'll catch on the side of the brush guide. This one didn't feel like it was doing that. And even though I'm tearing this down, I tend to keep things like little brush guides and, uh, well, maybe not these guides, but I'll keep the clock springs. Brushes don't have a ton of wear on them. These would still be usable. Uh, we can see just a little bit of discoloration on the wire, but the saw wasn't actually run so hard that these brush wires got super hot. When they get super hot and run hard, they'll get start to oxidize and actually change color, and it'll be real obvious. And uh, this tool actually wasn't treated with a lot of disrespect. It's just those darn blade retention systems on these Bosches. We'll just get into the electricals now. <laughs> I'll turn it this way so it won't be upside down and see what we got going on back here. Here we are with the electrical portion, got the whole clamshell part. All of this is uh, gonna be nylon, at least you do know that with the Bosch tools, you're gonna get fiberglass reinforced nylon. As a matter of fact, this housing is 35%. So definitely pretty uh, good build quality. Since this motor doesn't actually need to reverse, they just have it integrated. And this is actually pretty common on power tools that are these big long 
terminals. These are actually pretty specialized, as you can see. They are just long copper extensions on standard uh, spade terminals. And they slide, you know, past the brushes so they can plug into the back of the field winding. And these are actually a pretty rare item. And in various projects, these extension bars can be certainly quite handy. We can see that they do attempt to do what Milwaukee does. They have the variable speed uh, switching transistor. It's actually externally mounted on an aluminum heat sink up near the vents. Not quite as large as Milwaukee's, uh, but definitely a good effort. So I wonder if these uh, wire nuts are from the factory just to simplify uh, wiring, or if this was because those were pretty tight, whoever put them on did it properly. Or if this was something, some type of evidence of a previous repair with these wire nuts. Let me get those two screws out. It's interesting how, so the two-speed power, this transistor has the main power going in one leg, out the other, and then the third leg has a voltage, uh, which is controlling how much its on time is. That's the word I'm looking for. And so as you push the potentiometer and trigger more, it makes this have more on time and thus the motor goes faster. So what they've done with the reverse mechanism is they just have a resistor to the basically the low current side pin of this transistor just so it can only amplify so much. I guess it's a simple yet effective method. I will say I do kind of like this aspect uh, they have a little foam seal that probably presumably just has holes poked in it, but they're kind of undersized. So when you push the wires through, it attempts to prevent dust from entering in the, uh, the trigger mechanism through there. I thought that was interesting. I guess we're on to the mechanics. And so uh, sometimes on some of these tools, the boots are just heavily integrated on this Bosch. It appears that they have glued it or something. Where'd my screwdriver go? And so it sometimes is a puzzle to uh, get these boots off, um, such as that Bauer uh, big right angle half inch drill. They put the boot on like very first and all the gear change mechanisms and the, the, chuck me the, the chuck plate and all that stuff are all installed afterwards. So you kind of have to look, but I find it interesting. Uh, that Bosch did choose to put glue on this. It's already come off on that side. And then you got to, these are tight, and so you got to work them off. Sometimes the very hardest part on some of these tools is getting this boot off. I just decided to go ahead and cut the darn thing uh, because of this hump right here at the bottom. It was just impossible to really try to get enough grip and pull. It's almost a two-person operation with this Bosch. Uh, has really thick side panels on it. I'm kind of surprised about that. Heavy boot. And there's our gearbox. Kind of an interesting setup. It's a little bit cheaper to do it as two clamshells, one half on top of the other. But unfortunately, that design does make it one heavier and two, uh, the parts aren't aligned quite as well, although they should be pretty good because most of the castings one piece in the bottom. Milwaukee, the whole front end is just one casting which means that all the gears and machining are all held real nice and straight. And interestingly enough, they're actually using some pretty heavy duty. This is much more rare socket head cap screws. That's pretty nice. Let me get uh, the appropriate tools. Pull that blade retention mechanism out of there so you can see better what's going on. So they have this cam and you got to have the, uh, the thing all the way forward and then you push it all the way back, makes enough clearance. And there's like a plate under there that's kind of captured, but it always breaks. When you release the cam, it presses on the plate and forces the blade over that pin. And they should have just put a groove in this and then lowered the cam, and that would have made this mechanism actually tremendously reliable. They were trying on this. It's not just socket head cap screws. They're also nut and also held with nuts is what I'm meaning to say. Definitely pretty nice. What I actually should do is pull off this motor housing first. They did a pretty, it looks like a pretty decent job. It's all just self-contained into this, as most tools should be, is most of the parts of, that move are in the gearbox and it's just a motor that's attached. There we are, got those fasteners out of there. And look, the motor just pulls right out of the bearing. How convenient is that? So here we have our motor and we should be able to just ease it out of the gearbox. 
This has definitely been outside or in some work trucks. Some humidity has caused a little bit of corrosion on the motor. Some normal undercuts for balancing, but that's actually not too bad at all. Pretty decent motor, not a super thick layer of varnish. These more modern fans like this uh, just exist because they this baffling helps direct more air, helps provide a greater air differential, and so you get more airflow. They could have put a little bit more uh, protection on the, the intake side of the motor because this is where a lot of debris hits the motor. And actually, surprisingly enough, a lot of tools are just fine. But when it comes to rotary hammers and grinders, the actual amount of dust that they deal with and grit will actually abrade the wires away physically. They did put some epoxy around the windings and we can see that they're not pinched, but they're actually pressed or spot welded instead of being, you know, just a tang that's folded over the wire. So this is a reliable uh, mechanism. They've been putting in some tools, particularly Bosch's, they put these little rubber bumpers in there to actually reduce vibration for the motor. Or for, and uh, can help make the brushes last longer, but you got to really make sure that uh, you replace this rear bearing. Because as soon as it locks up, then it, this whole thing just starts spinning and burning up the back of this housing and ruining it. And this is kind of neat. You can actually see on this one, it's extremely deep set one because the reciprocating saw is bouncing back back and forth so much. It is in this interesting idea and probably does help with the uh, amount of vibration. And here's all the parts. Here's our motor housing, which is obviously one of the primary stress points. So it's really is pretty thick and heavy duty. Field winding is standard, you know, on uh, worm drive skill saws, the big deal about them is they have a dual field motor. And what that dual field motor does has is a winding like this and then a secondary winding further out so they get more, uh, you know, a higher average amount of magnetic field density across the entire circumference of the field. Um, as you can see on this one, it's like two highly concentrated areas with, you know, just a big gap. Um, but it's fine. The reason that all these fields are always wired independent instead of just, you know, one field is because to make a motor turn, a brush motor turn, the power has to come in through one field, come out, or it comes in through one side of this field, comes out, goes through the brush, through the armature, back out the other brush, into the second field, and then out through the, you know, the second wire in your power cord. And that's because uh, they are alternating current and then here's our brush guides which are a really integrated part and they just you know have this whole thing that goes deep enough to plug in there and then there's our little clock springs that were uh, just wound up in there and all you have to do is kind of wiggle them off and you can get them out of there. It's actually pretty smart with Bosch they put a little notch in there that captures it so that spring actually won't slide back and forth at all. Finally, for the gearbox, the part that we've been waiting for in this super long video. Really, the saw overall seems pretty well built. It's just, and I suppose you could probably dig up a replacement blade holder, but this whole housing is cracked and broken down here. And I have seen that on some Milwaukee's too. These fasteners are actually pretty tight. You can hear them crack, so definitely well torqued. Just enough clearance for a standard L wrench here. This is a bond hus. Some L wrenches may have slightly shorter L links. If we can get the wrench in there. There we go. That one was pretty tight. Always seems these socket head cap screws are super tight. You really want a quality hex wrench because when they strip out, it's just a nightmare. Absolute nightmare to try to get those things out. That one's loose. And this is the whole point for the ball end, is once you get it loose, then you can just spin it out pretty easily, not have to have the wrench at a, a perfect angle. It makes it easy to uh, get it in and out of the fastener. Let me go ahead and get these out. All right, here we go. This is where it becomes an immune system building exercise and everybody needs to uh, have a strong immune system, especially these days. And be careful rubbing your eyes and nose and mouth, at least before you wash your hands. This saw has seen a lot of days. Definitely some sawdust made its way in there, even though they do have a lip seal all the way around the top of this gearbox and a pretty heavy duty seal around the shaft. So this, I'm gonna have to do a little bit more work because there are some additional fasteners here 
that are apparently holding this whole mechanism together. So the whole orbiting action is this, it's going back and forth. Oh, and it does have a counterbalance. It did have pretty low vibration. I was wondering why it was so heavy, but it indeed, oh, I got jammed. There we go. We can see there's our counterbalance. So as the blade goes one direction, the counterweight goes the opposite direction. It's the same thing in a Milwaukee Super Sawzall. So it's really nice to see this and it did run uh, pretty smooth. Just the price of this lower housing and the blade clamp would have been more, well over, it would have been near the retail price of this saw. And you know, you can find one of these used for like 30 bucks or something. So that also explains the width. What Milwaukee did, did and uh, maybe it's a bit expensive, is this is so wide because the counterweight is this big fork on the outside. So you just have to have all this space for it. What Milwaukee does is the counterweight is a horseshoe and it's actually wrapped around the rod itself. And it's about the size of just this upper frame so they can just have a much more compact design. And what actually activates the orbiting mechanism is this thing just rocking back and forth. And how that's timed is right down in there. You can see that rotating portion. Well, that's like a camshaft. It's a lobe that's off center. So as it rotates around, it's timed for the saw to go flat and then tilt up and then pull back, providing that aggressive cut and then going forward again and so forth. So let me get this mechanism out of here. So besides a couple of more screws, there's also this cross pin, which is what this pivots on. I'll tell you why. Anybody trying to get that pin out right there, this thing, they're going to have a real special time. You need a uh, drive pin punch and a three pound fuller, and you're going to have to beat this like something you have never beat before. This pin was just... Just a huge, the entire, the, both the housing and this portion here were uh, set up as a press fit. So there was just an unbelievable amount of friction on this pin. Definitely uh, pretty surprised about that. That was never coming apart. That's how you get this whole section apart here. And voila, there's our counterweight and our swash plate. I did pull out these fasteners here or I did loosen them up. So I'm wondering how exactly we get the rest of this assembly apart. Oh, I see here, there's an E-clip that holds the reverse switch on. There goes that E-clip. Now the reverse lever should what pull out. There it goes. And it does have an, indeed like a little shielding plate. Oh, I see. It's just a little black piece of plastic, kind of like a wear plate. Now I wonder if we can't pry. Let me figure out how to get the rest of this out of here. Finally got that apart. All I had to do was beat it some more. <laughs> this tool is about, this assembly is about uh, a lot more usage of the hammer than you might uh, initially expect. Lots of hammer really is surprisingly well built surprisingly heavy duty to have some of the issues that it did especially on these old tools where you can't order parts like those lower housings but it just wouldn't still wouldn't be worth it because you can buy one new so they've done the simple method is this counterweight is just one big piece of steel wraps all the way around and so this wobble plate that drives the actual reciprocating mechanism has a post sticking off the back so as the plate goes this way it forces the weight backwards Milwaukee uses two different fingers uh, to make the gearbox more narrow. But this is a simple design. I mean, this is robust. It just, uh, they could have done a little more. Just a nice large bearing for the motor input. Then what I presume is a needle bearing right there for this driven gear, which is a helical cut, plenty large enough. And then on the front side of this, we have another large bearing. Rubber, actually, that's H, it's a brown seal, so it's HNBR. So that's actually a really nice bearing because of the HNBR seal on it. And then, of course, a snap ring to kind of hold it all together. More than just held together, these rods are also press fit into these steel end blocks. So you'd actually have to pull off that uh, snap ring and use a puller to get this apart. So definitely a pretty robust mechanism. We can also see, well, if I can get just enough light in there, this mechanism is actually pretty wide, wider than one ball bearing would be, 
So they actually have two ball bearings side by side to give this a bit more rigidity. We can also see that like on Milwaukee, this down in there, if we rotate this just a little bit here, if I can get the focus to also cooperate, we can see that offset portion. That's the angled portion that had the bearings are riding on, which makes the swash plate wobble back and forth. It's two pieces. That's actually a separate little machine piece that's then been slid on to the main shaft here. On a Milwaukee, that's all one piece billet. They just figured out a way to machine that eccentric onto a straight rod. This is also a little bit curious because the way this mechanism plugs into a socket where the Milwaukee, the finger once again is one piece and just the tip of it inserts into a gap uh, in the reciprocating rod itself. So it appears that they were some, uh, trying to get around some of Milwaukee's patents when they made this tool. And it's definitely, you know, it's American made German engineered. So it really uh, isn't too bad. Uh, they just missed the mark in just a few areas. One of them is this whole counterweight mechanism. I mean, this, this is probably three pounds of steel, three to five pounds. Uh, this is hugely heavy, just <laughs> wow. And the issue is, is because you have so much mass in the reciprocating rod, the lighter the rod is, the less counterweight uh, mass you need for it. So there's another kind of note here is this whole pin and socket system makes more weight. And then when you have a counterweight, you have to double that. So anyway, this was a super long teardown, but I've never actually had one of these saws uh, and wanted to see what it was like inside. So this is a great opportunity. And now for anybody who has one of these, at least they have a general idea of how to get it apart, knowing that if you need to take it apart into this portion, driving the pin out that retains this upper portion that allows it to tilt is a bear. Anyway, I really appreciate everybody watching and subscribing. And if you haven't subscribed, please do. Until next time, Caddis Maximus out.